In addition to traditional hematopathology, Dr. Sabbath has particular expertise in red cell disorders and coagulation. His current research interests include molecular diagnosis of hematologic malignancies and globin disorders, as well as detection of minimal residual disease in hematologic malignancies and solid tumors, and test utilization and coagulation. Dr. Sabbath will discuss a 27-year-old female with intractable bleeding after getting her ears pierced. Thank you, Dr. Sabbath, for being part of our expert hematopathologist video tutorial series. Today, I would like to present a case of a 27-year-old woman with a bleeding disorder. Her history includes significant menorrhagia, including two episodes that required transfusion. She also had a history of three elective abortions, one of which was uncomplicated, one required a transfusion, but she remained an outpatient, and in one case, she required admission to the intensive care unit, where she received four units of black red blood cells, was discharged from the hospital, and had to be readmitted due to continued bleeding. She also has a significant family history in that her mother has required transfusions on a number of occasions. However, none of her other relatives are known to have a bleeding disorder. Upon admission, a number of laboratory studies were performed. Her complete blood count showed a normal white count. She was anemic with a hematocrit of 23%, presumably due to blood loss. And she was found to be thrombocytopenic with a platelet count of 74,000. Her basic coagulation studies showed a normal prothrombin time of 14.1 seconds, a normal activated partial thromboplastin time of 29 seconds, a thrombin time of 17 seconds, and a slightly decreased fibrinogen of 147 milligrams per deciliter. In addition, she had a platelet function screen using the PFA100 instrument, and it showed markedly prolonged closure times using both the collagen ADP and collagen epinephrine cartridges, indicating either a platelet defect or perhaps a severe form of von Willebrand disease. Based on her clinical history and her laboratory studies, the most likely differential diagnosis includes either van Willebrand disease or some sort of intrinsic platelet disorder such as Glanzmann thrombosthenia, bernard soulier disorder, a storage pool disorder, or Wiscott-Aldrich syndrome. Since von Willebrand disease is the most common cause of bleeding disorders in the general population, her workup started with a von Willebrand disease investigation. This slide shows the results of her von Willebrand disease workup. Her factor VIII activity was normal at 72%. Her von Willebrand factor antigen was 55%. However, her von Willebrand factor activity, as measured by collagen binding, was only 23%, yielding a activity to antigen ratio of less than 0.7, which is decreased. She also had multiple analysis performed by Western Blot and you can see the gel at the bottom of this slide. The normal control shows the presence of high, intermediate, and low molecular weight multimers. On the left-hand side, you see a control specimen from a patient with type 2 von Willebrand disease showing a loss of high molecular weight multimers. And then you see the patient, and in that lane, again, you see a loss of high molecular weight multimers. So what type of von Willebrand disease might we be looking at in our case? Type 1 von Willebrand disease is a result of decreased concentration of von Willebrand factor, which is essentially functionally normal. So in type 1, you see low von Willebrand factor levels. You see decreased factor 8. But you see a normal multimer pattern on Western blot. And you see a normal ratio of von Willebrand factor antigen to von Willebrand factor activity. In type 2A von Willebrand disease, the defect is a loss of ability to form high molecular weight multimers for a number of different reasons. In this case, when you do multimer analysis, you see a loss of high and intermediate molecular weight multimers. And in addition, when you do a von Willebrand factor activity assay, you see a decreased ratio of activity to antigen. In type 2B von Willebrand disease, the defect causes an increased affinity for platelet glycoprotein 1B. On multimer analysis, you see a loss of high molecular weight multimers, and you see a decreased ratio of von Willebrand factor activity to von Willebrand factor antigen. In addition, patients with type 2B von Willebrand disease frequently 
show thrombocytopenia. Type 2M von Willebrand disease is a defect that causes decreased affinity for platelet glycoprotein 1B. In this case, you see a normal multimer pattern on Western blot, but you see a decreased ratio of activity to antigen. And finally, in type 2N von Willebrand disease, the defect causes a decrease in affinity for factor 8, and you see a decreased ratio of factor 8 activity to von Willebrand factor antigen and a normal multimer pattern. There's an additional type of von Willebrand disease, type 3, in which there's a complete absence of von Willebrand factor, and this results in a severe dis bleeding disorder that resembles, resembles hemophilia. Our patient was found to have a loss of high molecular weight multimers and a decrease in the ratio of activity to antigen, and that basically leaves us with either type 2A or type 2B von Willebrand disease. In either of these types of von Willebrand disease, you will see a significant bleeding disorder. You should see a positive family history because it's transmitted as an autosomal dominant trait. Typically, you'll see abnormal PFA100 tests. You'll see a decrease in the ratio of von Willebrand factor activity to antigen. Finally, when you look at multimers, in both cases, you'll see a loss of high molecular weight multimers and in type 2A, you also see loss of intermediate weight multimers. However, sometimes it can be difficult to distinguish these two because it's sometimes hard to draw the line between the high molecular weight and intermediate molecular weight multimers. So type 2A and type 2B can't always easily be distinguished based on multimer analysis. Our patient was also found to have thrombocytopenia, which would be more common in type 2B von Willebrand disease. And the definitive, definitive way to distinguish these two types of von Willebrand disease is using ristocetin-induced platelet aggregation. In ristocetin-induced platelet aggregation, you perform platelet aggregometry using both high and low-dose ristocetin to stimulate platelet aggregation. In type 2A von Willebrand disease, you see markedly reduced or no aggregation in response to any dose of ristocetin. In type 2B von Willebrand disease, you see hypersensitivity to ristocetin, in which case you get increased platelet aggregation in responses to low doses of ristocetin. In this slide, you see some examples. On the vertical axis, you see light transmittance, and as platelets aggregate, you see increased transmittance of light. In the left-hand panel, you see the results of normal platelet aggregation in response to doses of ristocetin, ranging from 0.8 to 1.1 milligrams per mil of ristocetin, and you see that there's no response at 0.8 milligrams of ristocetin, and you see a brisk response at 1.1 milligrams of ristocetin. In the middle panel, you see the results from a patient with type 2A von Willebrand disease, where you see essentially no aggregation in responses to even very high doses of ristocetin, such as 2 milligrams per mil. Finally, in the right-hand panel, you see the results of a patient with type 2B von Willebrand disease. In this case, you see very high aggregation in response to doses of ristocetin that are quite low. The 0.5 milligrams per mil of ristocetin shows very high platelet aggregation, whereas in the normal patient on the left, you see no response to 0.8. So obviously the patient, the platelets in type 2B are aggregating in response to very low doses of ristocetin, and this is what you see in type 2B von Willebrand disease, and this is what you see in our patient. So what are the clinical implications for type 2B von Willebrand disease. Well, first of all, you cannot use vasopressin or DDAVP to treat type 2B von Willebrand disease. In type 1 von Willebrand disease, you can use DDAVP to cause endothelial cells to secrete their Weibel Pilate bodies in which von Willebrand factor is stored, and you can transiently increase the level of von Willebrand factor in type 1 patients if they are having a bleeding episode or if they need to have a minor surgical procedure. If you have type 2B von Willebrand disease, if you treat with DDAVP, the endothelial cells will secrete this abnormal von Willebrand factor, which will then exacerbate thrombocytopenia. So this is contraindicated. If a patient with type 2B von Willebrand disease is bleeding or requires surgery, you essentially have to do factor replacement therapy. The current choices for factor replacement include Humate-P, which is a plasma-derived von Willebrand factor, factor 8 combination. And more recently now, we have 
available recombinant bromobrin factor, which can be administered with or without factor VIII as needed.